The importance and cultural character of Wyoming's indigenous Native American population is readily apparent to anyone who spends any time here. But the prominence of the state's present Native population obscures this region's earliest humans, those who migrated into this continent across the Siberian land bridge 13,000 years ago. Our next speaker, Todd Surville, has become the, one of the nation's experts on our earliest inhabitants, what archaeologists call Paleo-Indians. He's been excavating around the state and in um, Colorado as well, but most recently at a mammoth site called Laprell over near Douglas. Now, when you excavate a site like that, you find a good number of things, but how do you interpret them? How do you understand them? And how do you do that when we live in a world that's full of iPhones and plastic, photography, and um, McDonald's? So one of the things that you do is that uh, you find comparative um, cultures to study, because the bone and the stone relics do not speak. They do not tell us what they are or how they were used. They must be interpreted by the archaeologists who find them. So to assist in understanding that, archaeologists study Native peoples around the world who practice lifestyles that they think might be similar to the ones they are excavating. Uh, our first speaker this morning, Dr. Surveil, has been living with and learning from the Duca reindeer herders of northern Mongolia for several years now, uh, across all of the year's season, to try and understand how they acquire life's necessities. And when he's not traveling and not excavating, Professor Servell teaches in UW's anthropology department, where uh, recently we drug him into the dark side and made him into a department head. <laughs> um, but he is still teaching. Uh, he teaches everything from introduction uh, to archaeology to directing doctoral dissertations, and he drags all those students out into the field with him. But this morning, he's going to speak to us on stories from the Mongolian Tega. Mm -hmm. Dr. Servell. Thanks, Paul, for the nice introduction, and thanks to all of you for coming out on this snowy morning. Reminds me of many mornings in Mongolia, actually. This research, I'm really not going to talk about my research in Mongolia today. I, what I want to talk about are just some of the experiences I've had there, and the, the Doha way of life, how these people make a living. So sort of give you a tour of my journeys into the taiga and the seasonal round that the Doha experience in their lives. For me, this is a big change of pace. I study people, but normally the people I study are dead. Studying living people is unusual for an archaeologist, as Paul mentioned, uh, and it's challenging. It's challenging in its own ways. Going from Wyoming to Mongolia, Wyoming prepared me well in some ways. You should recognize this vista. The environment of Mongolia is not terribly dissimilar from the environment of Wyoming. It's a continental climate. It's high. It's dry. It's cold. Here's the Grand Tetons. This is a mountain called Dilgerhan Ol in the uh, Darhat Valley of Mongolia. Very similar looking landscape. Plains abutting snow capped mountains. So the environment was very similar. There were three things before I went to Mongolia that I wanted to experience. One language, when you're going to live with a group of people who you don't know, it's a good idea to get some experience with their language. Two horses, because the only way into the taiga is on the back of an animal, and three guns. I'm a kid who grew up in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. I didn't grow up around firearms, but I learned very quickly that if you want to learn about horses and guns, I live in a pretty good state to do that. <laughs> Turns out language, too. At the University of Wyoming, I met this woman, Bujidma Borhu. She was a graduate student in the Department of Botany. There are no classes in the Mongolian language at the University of Wyoming. In fact, there's only one university in the United States with classes in, in Mongolian language, and that's Indiana University. But Bujid Ma was working on her PhD in botany, and I paid her to tutor me for a year and a half in the language. That's her in front of Chinggis Khan, or Genghis Khan. 
She was a strict teacher, the kind who would smack your knuckles with a yardstick if you didn't study, so I learned, I did pretty well in Laramie, learning the Mongolian language. Nonetheless, my linguistic abilities were constantly a matter of humor among the Dolcha. This is Nirgui. Her name literally means no name. She's cleaning the small intestine of a reindeer that's just been slaughtered. One day in the fall of 2004, she came over to my house. By house, I mean a teepee. And by teepee, I mean an orts. She came over because there were only nine of us living in that camp. She wanted to chat. And she asked me if I had any photographs of her wedding. I had attended her wedding in the summer of 2012. And I meant to say, yes, I have many photos of your wedding. Not that she needs zormni ich zorg baga. She looked at me strangely, and it took me a minute to realize I had actually said, I have many pictures of your ground squirrel. <laughs> That's ground squirrel, or zorm. That's a wedding, or horm. <laughs> I made many mistakes like this. At the time I... <laughs> I meant to ask if there are no fish in the river because there was so much water. But what was heard was something about really hairy fish. <laughs> Horses. This is Eileen Hillman Choll. She was an undergraduate in the Department of Anthropology, an anthropology major. Now she's a dentist in Gillette. She was a barrel racer. She worked in my lab, and she put me on one of those horses, I can't tell you which one, a few times before I went to Mongolia, and it was a huge help. <clears throat> Getting into the taiga in the summertime, you go on horseback. This is me about six months ago, riding into the taiga. The first two years, I had no problems. The third year, again, 2014, I found myself in a situation not unlike this one. This young man is breaking a horse. I'd made two successful trips in and out of the taiga. I got on my horse in 2014 on day one, feeling very confident, and he took off. And I forgot everything Eileen had told me, because I felt like, I know how to do this. And he went running down the hill at full gallop towards a stream, and he was about to jump over the bank, about a six-foot drop, and I decided I did not want to go with him. So I bailed off, and it was painful. Two days later, we were riding through the forest, and I, had a, I was wearing a backpack. I will never do that again on a horse. And there's a tree that's fallen across the path, and I duck down under the tree, and the loop on my backpack catches the tree, pulls the tree free, and it falls onto my back, smashes me into the saddle. By the time I got into the taiga, I could hardly walk. When I told my friends in Wyoming that I wanted to get comfortable with firearms, I had many, many volunteers. <laughs> and it was good, because I was around a lot of firearms in Mongolia, and thankfully I have no humorous anecdotes about mishaps with firearms. So how did I end up going to Mongolia? It started here. This is an archaeological site in Middle Park, Colorado, near Kremlin. In the background, that valley back there is the valley of the Colorado River. This is a site called Barger Gulch. <coughs> this is a Folsom site, a winter campsite, where people, bison hunters, lived about 12 and a half thousand years ago. You can see some spear points on the right side of the slide. On the left side are excavations. Every little dot you see is a mapped piece of chip stone. We opened up big, big areas, and we found incredible spatial patterns. The red polygons there are hearth features or fire pits. And what we're really, the emphasis of our work was really trying to understand the social and spatial organization of this campsite where people lived at the end of the last ice age. And what I found after doing a lot of spatial analysis was that it was really easy to find spatial patterns, but I felt like Anthropologists and archaeologists really hadn't developed the theory and method that we need in order to interpret what those patterns meant for human behavior. This inspired me to want to go study nomadic people living in a temperate environment, and there aren't many places in the world where you can do that anymore. And that's how I ended up with the Doha. 
This is what we call ethnoarchaeology, or the study <coughs> of modern human behavior to develop tools for the interpretation of the archaeological record. And specifically, I wanted to study how people use space, how people decide where to do what they do, and how those decisions would be manifested in the archaeological record. This woman is rehydrating a hide. She's going to scrape it. She was going to make a gift for someone. This hide is, uh, I believe, of an, uh, a reindeer hide that was killed in the previous season and it had been stored away drying. And now she's spreading a mixture of flour and water on that hide. Then she'll wrap it up for a couple days. It'll soften it, and then she can scrape it. This is Mongolia, tucked between China to the south and Russia to the north. To give you an idea of the size of this country, we'll put Wyoming to scale in there. It's the 19th largest country in the world. We can put six Wyomings in there. It's about the size of Alaska. It's a big place. To get to Mongolia, you fly from, I fly from Denver usually to California, and from there, either to Beijing, or Seoul, or Tokyo, and from there into the capital city, Ulaanbaatar. It has a population of about <clears throat> 1.4 million people, which is about half of the population of the country. It's an interesting place. They had a giant mining boom in the 2000s. It was one of the fastest growing economies in the world, so it's uh, a lot of, it's like a lot of rapidly developing third world nations where you have a lot of wealth enter the country, but that wealth doesn't get distributed particularly broadly. So you have some brand new, shiny, high-rise, expensive apartments, and then this is surrounded by people living in yurts. In the wintertime, uh, there's not much fuel, and everybody's burning uh, fuel in their stoves, so they're usually burning things like coal, or trash, or even tires. So in the wintertime, the air quality is awful. Some of the worst air in the world. In the summertime, it's delightful. We fly into UB. We stay there for a few days. We call it UB, Olambatr. From there, we jump in a vehicle, and we drive about 450 miles northwest through the city of Erdenet to the provincial capital of the province of Khufskul, that provincial capital is called Murung. When I first went to Mongolia in 2012, the road was only paved for about half of the way. It took 18 hours in this small vehicle. And like driving on dirt roads in Wyoming, you get flat tires. This is the provincial capital of Murung, the administrative center, a population of about 35,000 people. This is a typical residential street. We spend a couple days there, getting our final supplies, and then I meet one of my good friends, our driver. His name is Nyembair, or Nima. Nyembair means happy Sunday. This guy is happy. He's always got a smile on his face. He's built like a tank. I arm wrestled him once. That was enough. From there, we travel north another 200 miles, mostly on dirt roads. This is sort of a typical view of a Mongolian road. Seasonally, we have trouble getting up there. For example, when you try to cross a river in the spring, and the jeep falls through, you have to break the ice from there all the way to the edge of the river to get across. That's a four-cylinder Russian Jeep called a Watts or a Furgan. This is from six months ago. The bridge was out, so we tried to cross this stream next to the bridge. The good thing about the bridge being out was you could steal the lumber from the bridge <laughs> to build a giant lever to lift the Jeep. That's me, by the way. It's Nima. 
We reached the end of the road at a place called Saganur. This is sort of the county seat of the county of Saganur. It's on a big lake called Saganur, which means White Lake. It's about 1,400 people here. This is close to the Russian border. Here we visit the border patrol, essentially, the, the, the border military, get our permits stamped. If we need any last supplies, we get them here. We drive a couple miles up into a valley called the Harme Valley. This is the Harme River. And from there, the journey gets more difficult. We spend one or two nights here. And then, this is always the most difficult and challenging part of our trip from here into the taiga. This is my friend Dembril. He's one of my guides. A fascinating guy. He's a sheep and goat herder. He also keeps yaks and horses. He always wants to talk about world events, international affairs, American history. He lives in a yurt in the middle of nowhere. Really wonderful human being and really talented guy to have in the taiga. He arranges our horses, in the summer months anyway, and we ride. So this is, see if I can get a cursor here. I cannot. Oh, there we go. This is the Darhat Valley or the Darhat Depression. This is Saganur, White Lake. This is where we take off. These are the Sion Mountains, and this is the Russian border here. From there, we ride for two or three days, 20 to 40 miles, depending on where the Doha are camped. I've lived in about six different camps. This was August of 2017. Everything we bring, of course, has to go on the airplane, and then in a Jeep, and then on the back of a horse. So it has to be compact. That's June to August. Other times of year, they have to go on reindeer. Not only our equipment, but ourselves. This is April of 2016, packing up into the taiga. This is summer of 2013, coming down out of the taiga. It rained for two days straight. Mud, rocks. Going down muddy, rocky trails on horses, it's better to walk than to ride. And trust me, after riding a horse for a day and a half, you like to do some walking. It's easier on your knees. This was April of 2016, the second day of our pack into the taiga, climbing over a pass at about 9,200 feet. It was about three feet of fresh snow, and the packs were falling off the deer, and we were stopping to adjust the packs. This day was absolutely exhausting. Mongolia has a way of beating you up when you're traveling and then warming you up when you stop. This is on the left, me and my graduate student on that rainy summer pack out of the taiga, enjoying a nice hot cup of tea. And this is spring of 2016 on the right, where we camped in about two feet of snow. And it was one of the most comfortable nights I ever had because these people take care of me so well and make sure I'm warm and comfortable and well fed. I know the question on all of your minds is, how do you ride a reindeer? <laughs> so I'm going to answer that now, carefully. It's a little different than a horse. You can't step in the stirrup and then put your leg up over the animal, because there's so much fat under that saddle, the saddle will just turn sideways. So you have to get your leg up over the saddle and jump on. If you're as flexible as I am, which is not very, you find a rock or a stump or the uphill side, and then you get on, and then the animal starts moving immediately, and your feet aren't in the stirrups, so you're totally out of balance, and then you fall off the other side, or the side you came on from. And if you get on and get the feet in the stirrups and get going, it's still really, really jiggly, especially in the fall when these animals are really fat. I have fallen off a reindeer more times than I can count. In the fall, when the antlers are big and in velvet, they're also right here in your face. When the animal turns its head, they'll hit you in the face. You only use one rein on the left side. I had one deer who refused to go right because of this. I tried to trick him 
by turning left three times, it didn't work. <laughs> to give you a sense of what riding a reindeer is like, here's a short video. If it will work. <laughs> it's my colleague Matt O'Brien in front of me. He's a professor at Cal State Chico. It's my colleague Randy Haas. He's a professor at University of California, Davis. That's our stuff on that deer. So it's a long journey. After leaving home, it takes at least a week to get up here. Usually more like 10 days, and when you do, you end up in a place like this. This is the Mongolian taiga in the fall. This is a beautiful alpine stream. We're at an elevation here of about 6,800 feet. The light-colored patches on the ground surface are lichen. This is reindeer food. The yellow trees, those are larch. These are deciduous conifers. They turn yellow in the fall and lose their leaves. They grow back in the spring. The dark evergreens are pine trees, which are important sources of pine nuts, which are an important wild food source in the fall. And up at the head of this valley, we're coming up on a Doha camp with three houses. One of those is the house they made for us to live in. There's also a corral with reindeer in the back of the camp. Reminds me of the Rocky Mountains around here at about 9,000 feet, but we're at 51 degrees north latitude here, so this is lower elevation. The peaks in the back are about 10,000 feet in elevation. So my house is on the left. The two families we're living with are on the right, and you can see reindeer behind the house in the corral. So that's, uh, that's our home in the taiga. It's a pretty spectacular place. It's incredibly isolated, too. You're about 40 miles from the nearest road when you're in the taiga. These are the Doha. They herd domestic reindeer, as you've seen. They're of Tuvan descent. The word Doha, Tuvan is a language family of Northeast Asia. That's their natural, that their um, traditional language, and that's what Doha refers to, their language and their ethnicity. The Mongolians call them Tsatan, which means with reindeer. They're traditionally nomadic, moving, depending on the family, as few as two times per year and sometimes five or more times. Some families will just move into the taiga for the summer and then into town, particularly those of school-aged children, uh, to, to look after their kids while they're in school. Other families will move, keep at least four camps and up to seven or eight. Their subsistence is based on the reindeer, meat and dairy, but also store-bought goods, most importantly, wheat flour, sugar, salt, uh, and some wild and plant and animal foods as well. There's some gathering, some fishing. Uh, traditionally, they were hunters and proud hunters, but hunting is now illegal in this area. The Doha number about 200 people who live in two separate geographic areas. This is the fall camp, or the summer camp, I studied in 2012 with nine households. You may see 10 there. One of these is a rental for tourists. <laughs> These are my good friends. I consider them my Mongolian parents. This is the family who I have studied and who have taken care of me for five years, six trips to the taiga. Bayandala is the oldest guy still herding reindeer in the taiga, and his family has been doing it for many generations. He is an impressive human, and his wife, equally impressive, Tsetsigma, on the right side. Their children are also wonderful. They have six of them, three sons and three daughters. Hos Erden, on the left, is a reindeer herder. He's also keep sheep and goat. Hos Jargal, in the middle, <coughs> is now a soldier. And his little brother, Hos Bilek, who's sort of the clown on the right, uh, is doing his mandatory one-year military service at the moment. I want to point out 
while we're packing up in the spring of 2016, Host Bilek has a puppy in his jacket, what they call a del. Mongolian jacket is called a del. This puppy was really small, about this big, and there was a lot of snow, so he couldn't make it on his own. So on day one, Bilek put the puppy in his del, and we rode all day that way. Day two, we were going up over this pass, and there was way too much snow, and it was going to be way too much work, so we couldn't put the puppy in his jacket. So we put the puppy in a flour sack, <laughs> tied him to a reindeer. We went all day like this, 14 hours. We were exhausted at the end of the day. We finally get into the camp. We're all sitting around drinking tea, and I said, hey, Bilek, where's the puppy? He freaked out and jumped up. Everybody forgot about the puppy. The puppy was passed out in the flour sack. He's been tied to a deer all day. He was totally fine. <laughs> but there was no other option. To, there was no other way to get this little dog into the taiga, and dogs are really important. They, they used to use them for hunting. Now they're used for protecting the deer. They're pretty much lookouts for wolves is their primary occupation, chasing squirrels and chipmunks, too. These are their daughters. Hos Bayer on the left is a large mammal veterinarian in town. She's college educated. She's working on her master's degree now. But um, she takes care of horses and sheep and goat and yak and, of course, reindeer. Hos Bagen is college educated. She studied English and compu computer science, but she's back herding reindeer in the taiga. Hos Chemek on the right, their youngest daughter, is studying to be a teacher in Ulaanbaatar. They're, they're all college educated. This is what a winter camp in the taiga looks like. In the winter, the Doha keep two camps, one near town, and this is the one near town, and then one way up in the taiga. So this is at low elevation, at lower tree line, at about 5,400 feet in elevation. That house you see there is not a house. It's a shed. It's a storage shed right next to it. It's a traditional Mongolian yurt, which is the house form that's used by some families in the wintertime. There's another one here. There are actually three households here in this camp. The third is right there in the trees. This is Bayandala. This is his son, Jose Erdene. And this is Jose Erdene's wife's parents uh, over here. Setsuk Ma says, I don't like the winter. It's boring. She feels like she doesn't have anything to do. This is because there's no milking to be done. There's no baby reindeer to be taken care of. Most of the reindeer are kept out in the taiga in a remote camp where they, young men are looking after them for the winter. Many of the young women go to work in the city and use this downtime as an opportunity to earn money. Tsitsigma usually spends this time looking after her grandchildren when they go to school because her daughter's working as a vet. That ice she's carrying is for water. There is no liquid water in this part of Mongolia in this time of year. All the water is in solid form, so if you want water, you have to melt it. It's at least 20 below, and she's carrying that ice with no gloves. They use these different housing forms in the wintertime because the traditional Mongolian orts is not insulated. It's a single layer of canvas. The yurt has a thick layer of felt that makes it much warmer. In 2016, I was there over New Year's, Christmas and New Year's Day, 2015, 2016. They were living in a Mongolian yurt. The next year, they built a log cabin, so now they're wintering in cabins. This is another winter camp, just to give you a sense of the landscape very frozen place. These, camp, this, these camps are accessible from town, obviously. The motorcycle photo of Host Jargo was in winter camp, and um, you can see the, the Forgan, the vehicle here. We're about 15 miles from town. This is what the Harme River looks like in winter. And when I say there's no liquid water, I mean there's none. You can go all the way down to the through the ice to the bed in this river, and you will find ice all the way. It is not flowing at all. So this is how you have to make water. It's
It makes the firewood economy a little easier in the wintertime because you can bring in lots of firewood on vehicles. When I was there, kids were out of school for the New Year's holiday, helping with chores. Splitting wood is a constant task, and this is true in all seasons, especially winter. We would wake up in the morning, and it would be about 40 below, 40 below Celsius, which in Fahrenheit is 40 below. It's where they meet. It's a convenient and uncomfortable temperature. We had boots that were rated to minus 120 degrees Celsius, but that rating is only meaningful if you're moving around. So we'd get up and start walking just to heat up our feet and warm up our boots, and we'd walk a mile. By the time I got back every morning, I looked like this. The warmest temperature we saw was 16 below. It went below 40 below every night. This is a cold cold place. I didn't think I could find a place that made Laramie seem warm. I did. <laughs> In April, they move into spring camp, pack all their belongings onto reindeer, and climb up over the pass into the taiga. This is in preparation for the young deer to be born. There's a lot of threats to these animals in the taiga, particularly the, the calves. There are wolves and wolverines, and eagles, and ravens, all of which can kill these calves. So they manage the birth of these calves very carefully, so they need to get into the taiga before they're born. And also, down in the Harmay Valley, it is just not good habitat for reindeer. These are the southernmost reindeer herders in the world, living on the edge of reindeer habitat, so they need to be in high elevations to get the forage for the reindeer. So in April, they move up into the taiga. This is what a spring camp, if the slide will change for me, this is what a spring camp looks like. This was in 2016. I moved into this spring camp in April. There were three households in this camp. This is well below tree line, but close enough that they could push the deer above tree line to graze. You can see the traditional house form there, what they call an orts or an ortsengir. Here we're on a south-facing slope. You can see the, the slope across the river there is quite snowed in. This slope is a mixture of deep snow and no snow. Every time it got, started getting nice, warming up this spring, I kept waiting for you know, signs of spring and flowers to bloom. Every time it started warming up and the snow started melting, we'd move up the valley, back up into winter. <laughs> The, the big job for spring is taking care of the, the reindeer calves that are born and milking begins. They also cut firewood for summer camps. So the summer camps are above tree line in the alpine tundra, and they're going to be there from June to August, and they need firewood for that occupation. So they spend a lot of time cutting firewood and transporting it up into the alpine tundra. I could show you a million pictures of baby reindeer, and some of you might like that. This is my favorite one. They're about this big when they're born. Two years later, you can ride on them. I mean, it's pretty <coughs> impressive. They're beautiful animals. And from the moment they're born, if they're born in camp, they're cared after. This is Bagana retrieving a young baby that was just born. She'll put an oya on it or bride all over its face, and they'll manage it very carefully. Let the mother go out and graze, bring the mother back, let the baby nurse, and as it gets older, give it time to, to forage, especially as the vegetation starts to green up. And once the young animals are born, the milking begins, so you don't ask me later. I'll just tell you what reindeer milk tastes like. It tastes like milk. There's nothing remarkable about it. It's quite good. When you're living outside in this kind of 
in, in nature like this, you start to appreciate the details of spring. This is a long winter in a cold place. This is the dwarf birch beginning to bud in May. Not only am I doing research, but of course I'm happy to help with chores, and this is what packing firewood into summer camps looks like. We packed a hundred deer worth of firewood into summer camp. About eight miles from where it was cut into where the summer camps were going to be. By later in the spring, we had moved up just above tree line into the southern part of a place called Mingbalak. This is a late season spring camp. The summer is delightful. Everybody moves into a place called Mingbalak. There are very large camps and very large herds. Camps with up to 10 households and over 1,000 deer. This is because this is the best reindeer habitat in Mongolia, and people can live in large group sizes and graze their herds together and stay there for a couple months, but it's really only possible in this one pasture. There's also lots of socializing, all of the doha in what's called the right taiga. This is the right taiga. Live in this valley within five or six miles from each other. There's lots of socializing. If there's a wedding, it will happen in this season. And there's also tourism. If you want to visit this place and these people, you can. You have to go in on horseback. I suppose you could hike in. I've never seen it done, but I thought about doing it. It's a, it's a long trip to get there, but it's definitely worth it. I've seen a lot of tourists from Europe, a few Americans, a lot of Israelis just out of the military, Koreans, Chinese. And the Doha take advantage of this tourism. They sell crafts to the tourists. Uh, they charge them for taking photographs. Summer is a good time for fishing. The fish, this river would be totally frozen in the winter, but when the river melts, these fish will swim up from the larger river downstream called the Shishkit. This is a local species of grayling. Absolutely delicious. These were caught with a hand line. Just nylon fishing line with a hook on the end and a little piece of rubber as a float. He'll catch a cricket, put it on there, whip it out into the river. When the fish hits it, he yanks it. He doesn't reel it in. I mean, he yanks it. And the fish goes flying behind him. He yanks it so hard. <laughs> Fetching of water is a constant task. Water is a constant need, of course, for cooking, drinking, cleaning, laundry. Young women spend a lot of time hauling heavy water from the river into camp. This is Nirgui's wedding, or before it. They built this orts for her. Usually the lodge poles are large. These three are pine. You leave the needles on there to signify the newlyweds. The house is green, and that's what all the canvas looks like when it's new. It eventually weathers to kind of a gray. During the wedding, we put about 28 people inside of this house. It was about eight meters across or 25 feet in diameter. Families <coughs> move from the summer camp. They cache things. The Doha generally don't move their lodge poles around. I mean, they'll drag them up to the f from the forest into the summer camps, but they'll cache them here and use them again next year. They've also cached here leftover firewood and some furniture that these kids are playing on. The butchery of reindeer won't happen before July because animals are not fat enough and they usually wait until much later in the fall. October and November is typical. This animal was killed for Nirgui and Erne's wedding. It was going to be a big party. They killed this animal. They shared it among the households, uh, the organ meats and the ribs, as is customary. Most, most of the meat was saved for that party. In August, they move into fall camp. This is Jos Erten and his family moving into fall camp, back down in the forest. They, they drop down the valley and then up a tributary valley, back up to tree line. Right behind him, in this bundle, 
is his son, who's one year old, in his car seat. <laughs> passed out on the back of that reindeer. And then all of their belongings in a big string of pack animals, and his wife is following up behind with another string. I love, absolutely love, the fall in the taiga. It's gorgeous. The taiga turns red and yellow. Most of that red you see there is dwarf birch on the slopes. There's bright red. Those are blueberry bushes. The large turn yellow, sort of lemon lime in this picture. And the mountains are absolutely amazing. Families disperse again because this is not as good a place to forage, to, to graze deer. The biggest job in the fall, they say, is castrating deer. <coughs> Two-year-olds. This was traditionally the time to hunt. It's a great time to gather. Berries are in season in the late summer and early fall. And pine nuts. Some um, tubers are dug. Antlers are sawed. This is to protect the animals from each other so they don't damage their eyes when they start to rut. And there are also preparations that happen for winter. So this is a fall camp. That house on the left is mine. I rent a house. They build one for me and I rent it. Here's some wild plant foods on the left, Siberian pine nuts. <coughs> on the right, what they call yellow potato or chartumus. It's a species of lily. It's a bulb. This is something I never want to experience again. Remember, not this, this. Remember I told you I'm a suburban kid from Washington, D.C. Castrating large animals is not something I do in my regular life. <laughs> Especially, say, 22 of them in one day, which is absolutely exhausting. And if you've never done this kind of work, it's not exactly fun. But it's necessary. If you, if you have any experience hurting large ungulates, you have to do this to the young males where they'll end up fighting each other and hurting each other and giving you a horrible problem in animal management. So they wait till these animals are two. And then the castrated males become pack animals and riding animals, what they call nzer, because they have a strong back by that age. This was absolutely exhausting. These animals were fighting, as you can imagine. This is the end of dairy season in October, so they're putting away milk like crazy and turning it into food products that can be stored for the winter. A lot of cheese is being made. And then in October, the families move into winter camp. And that completes the season, seasonal cycle. I've had many, many people Help me with this work, and I'm grateful to all of them. This would be really, really difficult work to do on my own. My colleague, Matt O'Brien, has been with me from the beginning, and Randy Haas, my colleague at the University of California, Davis, two of my students and one of my research assistants, Bridget Grun, Spencer Pelton, Willa Mullen, have all been wonderful companions in the taiga and huge help to my research. So that's my story. I hope you enjoyed it, and thank you for listening. Yes, sir. So many questions, but the top three are what do you do about medical stuff? What do you do with the antlers? And what do you take in their food wise? Do you supply or the medical? I have an incredible first aid kit with lots of prescription stuff, especially for gut issues, antibiotics, lots of first aid. I have a, a satellite communicator that if I push the button, a helicopter theoretically shows up, never pushed it. Question two, antlers. antlers. What do I do with them? What do they do with them? What do they do with them? So when they cut the antlers, they, they store them. They used to sell them to China. Now they do some carvings for tourists, beautiful antler carvings. They make a few implements. They make some hooks for hanging things from lodge poles. And your last question was food. I buy a lot of dehydrated meals. I bring in, for, for breakfast, we usually have oatmeal and some tea. 
and maybe some dried fruit. For lunch, we have like cliff bars or kind bars, granola bar kind of things. And then we have dehydrated meals, usually from Mountain House, that we bring in bulk. I don't want to take too much food from these people because I'm going to be there for at least a month. Yes, sir. How's your research going? What are you learning? The research is done. I did six field seasons over there. I think it went really well. Um, what am I learning? It's a really, you're, you're, you're sort of opening a Pandora's box because I can talk and talk and talk. But I'll give you one simple example, okay? So what I'm doing is I'm actually mapping these people as they go about their lives. At Barger Gulch, at this Folsom site, we, had ha we were able to identify households. One question we had was what season were they occupied in? And are there potentially spatial ways of looking at the distribution of artifacts that determine the season? So one thing we wanted to study was how people use these houses, what spaces they use for what activities, and how does that change seasonally. And one thing we found really interesting, simple and understandable pattern is that in the summertime, people tend to be positioned more towards the edges of the house. In the wintertime, they tend to be positioned more towards the center. They're moving in for thermoregulation to be warm near the fire, right? Also in the summertime, they tend to be towards the front of the house near the door where there's light. In the wintertime, that door is closed. They tend to move back towards the, the light that's coming through the center of the house. When we talk about people making and using stone tools, following those same rules, we would expect very different distributions of stone tools to be produced seasonally. And it looks like our pattern at Barger Gulch would be winter, based on what we learned from the Doha. So that's one example. Yes, sir? Chainsaws or uh, manual saws? Both. So hasn't that tool changed things dramatically? Absolutely. Bindalaw got his first chainsaw in the 1990s. Um, and it's hugely important. The one family he camps with frequently doesn't, they don't have a chainsaw, they often borrow that chainsaw, but it's make a huge difference in time savings. All kinds of things have changed dramatically from the people I study archaeologically to these people. These people have televisions in their house, powered by solar power and DVD players and electric lights. So I'll never find a perfect analog, right? And this is why when I mentioned like one of our results, we're focusing on really simple things like the distribution of heat and light and houses. It would be much less affected by technological factors. So for example, when the lights come on, we stop collecting data when they turn on their electric lights. Yes, ma'am. Um, this may be out of your realm, but how many people groups are in Mongolia? Ethnic groups? Uh, yeah. A lot. Um, something like 30-some. Most of them are, the biggest ethnic group is called Halakh, and this was Halakh. <laughs> X-A-L-X, Halakh. This was Chinggis Khan's ethnic group, but, you know, the, the local people in, the, in this area of Khuskul province are the Darhat and the Dokha. The Dokha are the smallest ethnic group in Mongolia, so there are many ethnic groups. I know six-sided hogans that are stable, and a group in Mongolia, and I don't know which area, that's why I was asking you, live in six-sided yurts that move, and they all work with sheep and work turquoise. But that must I'm not, obviously I, it, be one small section. It, it, it probably is. I'm not familiar with those okay. particular people. They, they speak the Athabascan uh, language. In Mongolia? They're Athapaskan speakers? <laughs> That's news to me. Yes, sir. Uh, this looks like good mosquito country. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> if, if they have mosquitoes, what is their answer to DEET? Well, that's easy. I thought it would be mosquito country, too. I never saw one in eight months in the taiga. It's a remarkably bug-free place. Yeah. Could you comment on uh, their concept of land ownership or family territorial claims? I can. Mongolia is starting to privatize land, but before that, all land in Mongolia is public. Nonetheless, Bindala and his family have been using these places to camp since the 1980s and before. So I've been told, Bindala owns this valley. So if I want to camp here, I need his permission. 
Okay, so there's no formal legal ownership, but it's considered to be his property because he's been living there and using it for so long. So there's an informal sense of ownership is my impression. And certainly when it comes to reindeer, the herds are owned by individual families. The government no longer permits hunting? Correct. And what were they hunting and how do they manage things like wolves? They were hunting moose and elk, red deer, uh, musk deer, um, uh, ibex, um, sable, squirrels, wolves, bear. Uh, how are they managing wolves? Mostly with dogs now. I wouldn't be surprised if somebody saw a wolf, I'd bet they'd shoot it. Um, but mostly with dogs. We, when I was there in the fall of 2014, they lost six animals to wolves. We had wolves circling the camp. I never saw them. I saw wolf prints within 200 meters. It was a really tense time. Uh, they obviously live by the season. Is there any evidence of climate change? And is it, if so, is it affecting them? <laughs> it's a terrific question. Uh, they're aware of climate change. They don't perceive it as a huge problem now, but they certainly recognize that they're on the edge of reindeer habitat and pressed up against the international border with nowhere to go. I predict it's going to be a serious problem for them as the climate warms. That is if their way of life persists to that point. There are a lot of outs uh, outside pressures that are threatening this way of life, if, if you consider it a threat. They don't, re they don't really seem to, to have a lot of concern about whether their way of life continues into the future. I, I often ask them, do you think there will be Doha people 50 years from now? And the answer I get is, I don't know. And they don't seem terribly concerned about it. Yes? How do they deal with that international border now? And is that with Russia? Is that marked? Is that patrolled? Is that... Uh I've been told there's a fence and it is patrolled. Nobody goes over there from what I can tell. It used to be a good place to hunt because it's so far from town. Um, they migrated into Mongolia permanently for the last time after World War II in the 1950s and some of those elderly individuals who came as children have never been across that border since they came across in the 50s. It's kind of a no man's land is my impression. Yes, sir. The, uh, there are animals, I assume, that are not castrated, that are kept for breeding? Yes, purposes. bulls, and yeah. How, how are they dealt, how are they managed? How they, they so, so from what I can tell, the bulls are only carefully managed in the fall during the rut, at which point they are, they're tied out to graze on a long tether by themselves. They can't get into too much trouble. And then they're put into the corral with some females to breed. Other times of year, they're just left to graze with the rest of the deer. They're occasionally ridden. They're big, big animals, as you can imagine. Yes, ma'am. Um, what about interpersonal conflicts uh, within the, the groups or between groups or crime, uh, anything of that nature? These... One thing that struck me about my time in the taiga is these are the happiest people I've ever met. They're so happy, they always make me wonder, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> I see very, very little conflict. Sometimes uh, fathers bickering with daughters or fathers bickering with sons. But I see very, very little conflict. I've seen very little crime. So I don't have a lot of experience with it. I've been biasing this side of the room. Anybody on that side of the room have questions? Yes, ma'am, way over there. How did, when they stopped hunting, how did that change their eating habits? Well, it, it meant they had to eat a lot more reindeer, right? The wild meat is free meat. Reindeer are, is their bank. And, and Bindala has a big herd. He has over 100 animals. The average herd size for each family is about 30. So they can't. They can't kill that many animals per year. So if you were able to exploit wild meat, it meant you got to conserve your own personal supply of meat. So it's seriously affecting herd sizes. Yes, ma'am. How do they designate their 
Kurtz, because you're saying there, like he has a hundred. Do they brand or do they mark with dyes? Because she said there were like a thousand people there at that one time at that one camp. Yeah, they, they mark them two ways. Um, at one year of age, they mark the ears. So that every family has a unique cut on the edge of the ears. Some, you know, some will have one cut on the side of the right ear or two cuts on the other side of the left ear. And the other way is they brand them, but not with hot steel. They just cut a brand into the fur with scissors and it has to be renewed once a year. Yes, sir. How about um, religion? This is the homeland of shamanism. They are shamans. I haven't seen a lot of religion. It seems to me to be, to come out in times of uncertainty, times of need. When we were castrating those deer, essentially a bloody surgical procedure that can injure the deer, they kept a, a small fire burning the entire time. It was smoking juniper, um, a little sacrificial fire. Um, before traveling through the taiga in inclement weather, They'll often smoke juniper. Um, I imagine in the case of serious illness, the shaman would, would be called in. I, I had one experience with the Darhat shaman. It's basically fortune telling. Um, but my impression is that, that they're not overtly or often religious. There's not a lot of regular observances, but in times of need, you see it. And I don't know a lot about it. Very back. Is there any population of wild reindeer? It's a good question. There was um, in the past. It's not clear if there is now. I've heard in fur further north in Mongolia there are. Bayandala, just this last fall, was telling me about how he had shot a, a wild reindeer on that hillside right there, like in 1982 or something. Um, so there were, there were wild reindeer. Yes, sir. Uh, you had mentioned or it was filmed with the, that family of six, and there were the three daughters. All three of them were educated. I didn't quite understand. Are they still in college, or did they go to college and then come back? And if so, why did they come back and not pursue the profession? So, first of all, one of them is still in college, training to be a teacher. The other one. The oldest one became a vet, and she moved into town because there were veterinary needs. And her main interest was being a vet for the doha, for the reindeer. So basically serving her community by coming back. The middle daughter, Bagana, I don't know why she came back to the taiga. I assume it's because her parents need help. That's a lot of work managing 100 reindeer, milking 50 of them. Right? I also note the sons are not college educated, and this is a common pattern in Mongolia. Most of the herding responsibilities go to young men. So this is what families commonly do, is they'll direct their sons into the herding side of things and their daughters in, to college education so they can participate in the cash economy to provide an income for the family. So very often, women are better educated than men in Mongolia. Yes? <coughs> are there any big cats, like snow leopards? And there were. I mean, there are parts of Mongolia that have snow leopards, and I've asked Bayandala often about snow leopards, and he's never seen one. Um, traditionally, this was habitat for Siberian tiger and snow leopard. Now there are um, lynx, I believe. Uh, I know the Mongolian names <laughs> more than I know the English names. I've never seen. I saw a bear once when I was there, a brown bear, but I haven't seen any of these cats or prints from these cats. Yes? What was your paperwork process to get over there, and how much did it cost you? And then, last year, did you plan on going back? Or? It's a remarkably easy place to work. You can stay for, I think, 75 days on a tourist visa. Um, to access this area, you need a special permit because it's a border region. And it's a pretty simple process. I always took care of it before I arrived. Give yourself a few days in advance. 
A flight to Mongolia costs about $2,500. Once you're in country, it costs about $1,200 for vehicle and hotel to get up there. And another $500 for horses. I would say it's about a $10,000 round trip per field season minimum. Are you going back? Am I going back? I have no more money. <laughs> <laughs> But these people are my friends, and they feel like my family, and I care deeply about them, and I will go back, but not as a scientist. I'll go back as a, as a friend at some point. Thank you.